God's words to Jeremiah may well be the message America needs to hear today. It's time to stop trusting in lies. I need to talk to you about Israel's ancient destruction and America's soon coming destruction. But I don't want anyone to be confused. Don't think that God has abandoned Israel. The Babylonian exile, just like the later catastrophe brought by Rome after the death of Jesus, were temporary conditions, just like Israel's rejection of our Messiah. Temporary. But why? I was studying this at the coffee shop this morning. What I read was that Paul was trying to explain it to his believing non-Jewish friends that, yeah, Israel was down, but not for the count. I love what he said. Are they down for the count? Are they out of this for good? And the answer is a clear cut, no. Ironically, when they walked out, they left the door open and the outsiders walked in. But the next thing you know, the Jews were starting to wonder if perhaps they had walked out on a good thing. Now, if they're leaving, triggered this worldwide coming of non-Jewish outsiders to God's kingdom. Just imagine the effect of their coming back. What a homecoming. And that's from Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 11. America, on the other hand, when it's toast, it's game over. You see, when the Jews are all home in Israel, and the whole world turns against the Jews, the end will come. They will then see the anti-miracle of the coming of our Messiah. They will cry out to God. They will see the promised Messiah, Jesus, in that day, and all Israel shall be saved. Again, I don't want any confusion. This promise is for those who are alive in Israel at that time, who cry out to God to be saved from the destruction that surrounds Israel. It's at a time, at a place, and it's an event that is prophesied and will happen. And at that time, God will redeem all who turn to him in the day of his glorious return. But America? Well, wow. America's not going to be so blessed. You see, we've already had our blessings and we've squandered them. We've insulted God. The time of the Gentiles to turn to Christ is rapidly coming to an end. You can thank God and Israel for the many years your door to salvation was left open. It's a mystery that has now been revealed. The Bible says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. It's found in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 to 27. And with that, I need to talk about the international economics, the politics of failure, and the soon coming destruction of America. <laughs> Welcome to Crosstalk. God is going to destroy America. By the way, that's a hook. He will do it, but it might not be Thursday. We might implode due to international or political lunacy. But I got to tell you, our enemies do appear to be uniting in currency-busting efforts and through energy confederations that appear poised to crush us. Now, our God may simply clean house and sweep away everything away that offends his sensibilities. If he does, that wouldn't leave much more than a remnant in America. And that's why it's crucial to join us in God's remnant, because a remnant will be saved.
If our communist enemies in China and Russia have their way, the creditworthiness of the American dollar, the U.S. economy, and the American dream could be reduced to a shambles without ever having a shooting war. A simple agreement between our enemies and the oil-producing nations of the world who are not our friends anyway could change everything without ever firing a shot or lobbing a missile in our direction. Maybe it already began by lobbing a brick at us. You know what the bricks are? Did you know that the BRICS members are now becoming enamored with the Chinese Yuan? Like OPEC, the BRICS are another group of nations heavily interested in either oil production or oil acquisition. I want to make sure you understand this. The BRICS are currently Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa. Most of them have already agreed to accept the Yuan in exchange for their oil. Egypt recently joined the BRICS. It's quite a club. You should also know that other nations who have applied for membership in the BRICS include Turkey, Argentina, Indonesia, and Saudi Arabia. All of this has been happening right under our noses. Instead of reacting intelligently, strategically, and in recognition of America's own national security interests, our leaders have drawn us into petty political infighting campaign theatrics and the drama of the clown show at the Washington Circus. Our politicians would, I don't know, they would rather focus the international discussion on America reducing our use of fossil fuels instead of demanding that our enemies reduce their use. Why does China get away with producing twice the greenhouse gas emissions as the United States? How come 75% of the world's new coal-fired power plants were built by, oh yeah, China? Why would our leaders be screaming at us instead of at our greatest enemy, who coincidentally is also the greatest pollution producer on our planet? Oh yeah, it's China. And here's another thought. If our responsibility is to fix, I don't know, this so-called man-made climate change because it might be a risk to future generations, why wouldn't our leaders demand an immediate fix for the immediate risk that we face in our generation? It is our generation that could witness the destruction of the American way of life due to the shift in what we call the petrodollar and more perplexing, we know that we could completely wean ourselves off of our dependence on Middle East oil, but we choose not to because it has been decided that such a move would be politically incorrect. What brainless people came up with that notion? I gotta ask you, why is it correct to buy the same amount of oil from our enemies as it would be to use that amount of oil from our own resources? Why? Why is it less offensive to burn expensive Arab oil that must be shipped across an ocean? You know, it doesn't just magically appear. Why is that less offensive than utilizing homegrown local energy, creating high paying employment for American workers and creating taxable profits for companies who would be happy to pay those taxes if the government would just get out of the way and let them drill for, pump, and make their oil available right here at home. Why is it wrong to build our own economy, but somehow it's right to enrich the economies of our enemies? By the way, lower prices at the gas pumps would also be a nice benefit if our leaders would just simply get out of the way. You know, not that long ago, we had reached the position of being energy independent. We were prospering through harvesting and exporting our excess energy to other nations. Why did we let our politicians destroy American jobs, American energy independence, and potentially the economic future of America by becoming more dependent all over again on our enemies? Why do we continue to help them prosper at our own expense? By the way, did you know that 
Even our friends are showing interest in joining the BRICS? Mexico apparently wants to apply, and even Canada now has some interest. Now that we see our greatest economic and political foes and a few of our friends sort of joining forces against us. I mean, if they build up the petro yuan at the cost of the petrodollar, that's bad. How, how can we allow our leaders to change the topic of the national discussion simply because they seem incapable or disinterested in protecting our status in the world economy? Now look, I am all for clean energy. I'm all for responsible behavior. But listen, before we solve a future generation's potential threat, shouldn't we deal with the existential economic threat facing our generation? When Americans are struggling to make ends meet, why not begin creating more value for the U.S. dollar and more jobs for American workers? It, instead of yielding to our enemies who intend to displace the U.S. dollar as the international reserve currency, why not protect our benefit and retain our stable position by generating more dollars for Americans through creating our own energy instead of buying it from our enemies? America sits on an economic time bomb. Nobody knows how high the national debt will grow before the system just breaks under the stress, the interest payments, or the actions of our enemies. Nobody knows if it will happen during our retirement years or those of our grandchildren, but things will not go on forever if left unchanged. This time bomb will never be diffused if we continue printing money and insist on ignoring the steady ticking in our ears. And what does all this have to do with Jeremiah? I want to talk about Jeremiah. God had told Jeremiah that he'd had enough disrespect from his disobedient children. It was as if God had picked Jeremiah to inform his people that they had finally crossed the last line in the sand. And in so doing, God was going to personally orchestrate a brutal invasion by foreign pagans to punish his disobedient children. I'm sorry to say the children of Israel had become pagans. They worshiped idols and sacrificed to false gods. God simply hired a better bunch of bigger, better pagans from Babylon to do what pagan nations do when they conquer other pagan nations. He told Jeremiah that this was going to happen. He also told him that when it was over, he would deploy a different bunch of pagans from Persia to punish the Babylonian pagans after they had served their purpose. He did that too. Sin offers no free lunch. Judgment eventually comes to all who earned it. Sin brings judgment unless there is an atonement. And don't blame God for the storm of pain that came to Israel. Blame the spiritual climate. You know, for a brief moment, I asked myself, what is the spiritual temperature of our nation? How pagan-like has America become? Is God honored in our legislative system? Do our judges protect the innocent and defend the nation's most helpless? such as those foreigners who are actually fleeing for their lives. Please, don't confuse the terrified innocent with the violent cartel criminals or the terrorists who want to kill all of us. I don't know how to sort them out, but they're not the same. Look, I'm glad they let my father come in before the Nazis wiped us all out. I'm thankful that my wife's parents got out of their country in time before Mussolini forced his tyranny across all of Italy. I don't have the answer, but I have a tough question. Does America still honor life and godliness? Or has that ship sailed? What is the message we now send the world? I must ask, is God pleased with the standards now celebrated in America, or have we also crossed a line in the sand. Will God continue to tolerate the slaughter of babies in those abortion clinics 
who refuse to put away their instruments of death? Will God turn a deaf ear to the helpless immigrants who have fled persecution in the hope of finding refuge in the land that was once a beacon of hope to the hopeless? Will God close his eyes to the tragic perversion of young boys and girls who are forced to question the most basic biological facts of their physical identities? You know, when the woke crowd demands we trust the science, can we still agree that biology is a science? What's the upside to destroying the fabric of the family? How much homosexuality, infidelity, sexual confusion, aberrant immorality will God endure before he shuts the door? How much filth and stench must God countenance before he refuses to even listen to our pathetic prayers? I don't know. My prayer is that we turn to God before his reprisals are unleashed in full accord with what we deserve. God's words to Jeremiah may well be the message America needs to hear today. It's time to stop trusting in lies and it serves no purpose to trust in some religious form without the Spirit of God. If we want a future for our nation, I believe God says to us, amend your ways and your actions. The hearts of the people in Jeremiah's day were opposed to God and they had become self-centered. It led to abject suffering among the weakest in society. The same is happening in our nation. Who cares for the strangers in our land, the immigrants, the children without parents, the women left without a husband's protection or provision? In Jeremiah's day, they were cast to the margins of their society. So it is in our culture today. And our violent failures extend beyond the audiences to whom God sent his prophets so long ago in ancient Israel. We in America have even promoted the slaughter of the unborn, the weakest of the weak, who have no voice or vote. If we hope to continue to enjoy freedom, prosperity, religious liberty, and a position of power and influence on the world stage among corrupted societies, we must cease mirroring and celebrating abominable corruption. We must identify the need and embrace the correction proposed by God if we're to enjoy his blessings. You know, his promise to Israel was simple. Change, change now. This is also his message to our nation. Like ancient Israel, we may also be on the verge of judgment coming to our shores. Now, ours may be an economic judgment before the final judgment day ends everything as we know it to usher in the new heaven and the new earth. That day will also come. Until then, I want you to hear what God warned through Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers. By the way, I think our wickedness has surpassed that of the Jews in 7th century B.C. Jerusalem. America swells with pride in our disregard for God. The laws, the dishonesty, the hypocrisy, the delusions, the perversions, the inequalities, and the injustices foisted on the nation by our leaders deserve judgments more severe than what God promised to ancient Israel. The message version of God's words to Jeremiah for God's people should cause us all to listen, to turn, and to repent. The prophet delivered a message of unmitigated defeat 
destruction, and death. God said in a most down-to-earth interpretation through the message, you left me. Remember? God's decree, you turned your back and walked out. So I will grab you and hit you hard. I'm tired of letting you off the hook. I made sure you'll lose everything since nothing makes you change. I created more widows among you than grains of sand on the ocean beaches. At noon, mothers will get the news of their sons killed in action. Sudden anguish for the mothers, all those terrible deaths. A mother of seven falls to the ground grasping for breath, robbed of her children in their prime. Her son sets at high noon. Then I'll round up any of you that are left alive and see that you're killed by your enemies. Now some hearing that might say, oh, God would never do anything so evil. Some may rise up in self-righteousness and declare, I certainly don't want to believe in a cold, heartless God like that. My response to such notions is simple. We have done evil. God simply followed through on his promise to judge and punish evil. Read his word. You can choose to believe in any false God you create in your own perverted minds. You can make up any image of God you want to follow. That's what they seem to be doing in Washington, D.C. It's what is being done in many churches, mosques, temples, and shrines around the globe. You can be both brainless and heartless, but my God is supreme in wisdom and love. He sent his emissaries to warn us, to teach us, to prepare us, and to save us. If we reject his messengers, don't blame God. Now, though it has become almost trite in our culture, John 3.16 is still worth hearing and hearing and hearing again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is a truly evil God, a heartless parent, or a wicked government, who convinces any little boy that he was supposed to be a little girl, and allows a child to be emotionally emasculated or chemically castrated. It is a wicked system, serving an evil God, who promotes adultery as satisfaction, abortion as choice, government theft as liberality, personal responsibility as archaic, and freedom as selfishness. Those who replace personal responsibility with victimization embrace the 21st century religion of a much worse false god. I agree with John Wayne, who was often quoted as saying, life is tough. It's tougher if you're stupid. My advice is, don't be stupid. And with all this bad news that I've brought, I have some great news for you. Fear not. If you are a true believer, a true follower of Jesus, rejoice. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. And that, my friends, is what I call shouting news. By the way, though it might happen sooner rather than later, America will absolutely be destroyed. But not to worry, the entire world will be sucked into that giant swirly when everything gets the big flush into the cosmic sewer where all the filth, degradation, and stench of this fallen world will accumulate the earned compound interest of the wages of sin, which is death. However, as I said, not to worry. There will be a new heaven and a new earth 
So the current version with all its bugs, malware, spyware, and flesh-eating worms will be gone. You can be sure that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? <laughs> I just, I got to remind you, this is the real deal. The present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They're being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But don't think God enjoys such destruction. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with the terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives should you live? Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. So be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to Him, both now and forever. Amen. And with that, I will want to remind you that I love America, I love Israel, and I love God. My prayer is that America and Israel will turn to God, seek His forgiveness. May we return from having wandered so far from His ways and His Word. If we do, He has promised to draw us near to Himself and to forgive us. But there's a time limit on this offer of grace. For soon, only judgment will be offered to those who have ignored Him. I hope that you've understood the things I've been discussing, and if you have questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. If you agree with the things that I've brought to you, I hope that you will let me know. I look forward to your comments. I could use your encouragement. Till next time, shalom, and God bless you.